folks, I think we'll uh, get started. Um, we are fortunate to have Marjorie S.K. Auerbach here this evening. And uh, Marjorie, uh, for yeah. several years now, has been most uh, pleasing relationship. I'm sure you'll find her to be um, smart, witty, and very kind. Uh, she's an MD and a JD, so you can also watch her link. Um, she completed her MD at the University of Michigan, orthopedic uh, surgery residency at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and a lumbar spine surgery fellowship. Uh, she has served over the years on, on different boards of directors, including International Academy of Independent Medical Examiners and the North American Spine Society. Uh, she has also agreed to chair of occupational environmental medicine practice guidelines for the lumbar spine and cerebral thoracic spine. So uh, we're thrilled with that as well. Um, we do have people online and probably will be monitoring online. So uh, anybody online, please put comments uh, in the uh, chat and bubble will help. Thanks. Marjorie, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Those people online, we're going to hold questions. I'm going to try and go for about 50 minutes and then we'll hold questions for the audience. Um, so, I'm going to speak today about the failure of non operative care and the fact that it is not an indication for surgery. And I'm going to guess that all of you have seen medical records that say this person failed conservative care and now should be sent to the surgeon. Um, these are just my disclosures. Um, and just to give you an overview, I want to talk about what failure really means in the context of conservative care. And conservative care, for our purposes, conservative care is really non-operative care. Those words get used interchangeably, certainly among surgeons. Um, why patients fail conservative care, what you can expect for surgical outcomes of those patients, the importance of the biopsychosocial model, which I'm sure you are all well acquainted with, mentors. Um, placebo and nocebo, and what you do. So this is a real case example. Um, actually, I just saw this gentleman a couple of weeks ago, 39-year-old guy. He is a minor at EMT. He had, until this accident, participated in Mind Rescue Team, which is apparently a very competitive um, exercise. So he was in very good physical condition, had no other previous medical conditions. Um, he was in a rear-end motor vehicle collision with a company truck. The visuals are bad because the other vehicle was a semi, but it was a very low-speed collision. And actually, when you look at the pictures of this truck, I probably should have put some up. You really, what you see is that the bed of the truck is slightly indented. Um, he was taken to the ER because everybody in the community knew him. EMS came to the scene, and he was taken to the ER and treated as a trauma patient. And that's important because it set things up. I mean, here's a person who, based on the mechanism of injury, is unlikely to have anything truly major, but he was treated as a trauma and then discharged in stable condition on the same the next morning, his latest. So he goes to see his primary care physician who takes x rays and places him off work. Um, Ten days later, he goes back, he still has back pain, so of course an MRI gets ordered because that's what anybody would do. Um, and um, the MRI shows all degenerative change, and this is actually his film. I don't know how long it's here, but it shows degenerative changes. Um, there are motor changes at the end plates. Um, I will tell you the axial images show some disc bulging. There's no nerve root compression, uh, nothing of any significance. Um, and he's referred to physical therapy. And interestingly, after a period of time, he's doing well in physical therapy, but then you see, apparently in workers' compensation in Wyoming, this is a Wyoming case, there is no limit on the number of physical therapy visits you can have. So he continues to go to PT. So of course, every time he goes in and says he's still having some back pain and some leg symptoms, um, additional therapy is recommended. But the question here really is, what is he being treated for and what is the diagnosis? 
And you really need to know the diagnosis to know what appropriate treatment is. You need to know the diagnosis if you're going to do a causation analysis and figure out whether the accident actually caused his condition. Um, and we're talking about negative studies in the ER. His physical exam is mostly complaints. There are actually no real findings. So he has low back pain, no radiation to his lower extremities initially. He does later have left lower extremity symptoms and no neurological complaints initially. There are no focal neurologic findings on exam and no acute findings on MRI. So the question is, you know, what diagnosis do you give this gentleman? And this is the diagnosis he got in the ER, which was low back injury and sprain and strain. So all three were actually listed, very useful for coding purposes, but not really an accurate reflection of anything because the question is, is there an injury? So in the medical legal setting, which this eventually becomes a compensation case with involvement of lawyers, um, but also in the personal injury setting, just because uh, there are a lot of things that are similar, um, symptoms with- Oh, okay, they're pretty good. Symptoms without objective findings of injury, are very often attributed to minor trauma events. And by minor trauma events, I mean, it may be a motor vehicle accident, it may be a slip and fall, but there are no major bone, you know, major fractures. There's no major spinal injury, nothing identified on imaging. However, there is this belief now that low back injury occurs frequently, even when there are no objective findings. And the, and the question that the lawyers always ask is, well, just because it isn't seen on the MRI, does that mean it doesn't exist? Um, and MRI, as you know, has gotten very sophisticated. There have been multiple iterations. And at this point in time, I think it would be reasonable to say that if it isn't seen on MRI, it is not likely clinically significant. And certainly in somebody who has no clinically significant findings on an exam, if their MRI shows only age-related changes, um, then you need to sort of moderate your discussion with the individual about their condition. And I'm sure you already know this, but stru structural changes are rare in patients who become symptomatic after minor trauma. You're all familiar with how common low back is. Um, certainly as people get older, it's more common. Very often people will tell you they've never ever had an episode of low back pain. Truly, they probably have, but not everybody seeks care. And the episodes they remember are the ones where they've gone to a doctor. So most often, people will try and work through it, but they conveniently forget that when you're trying to find out if they have a history of previous symptoms. Most important thing is that there are no pathognomonic findings on physical exam or radiographic examination MRI in nonspecific low back pain. So, it gets called a lot of different things. And you'll see in medical records, discontinuity, the set syndrome, sacroiliitis, which sacroiliitis is not a condition of normal everyday living. Um, and at this point, in spite of the fact that we have multiple injection procedures that aim at identifying the pain generator, at this point, it's very difficult. There is no identifiable pain generator in nonspecific low back. And for the purposes of interaction with patients, that's very difficult because they want to know what the problem is and what the matter is. And you don't necessarily have an answer um, that's what they want to hear. It's not that you don't have an answer, but it's not the answer that they're interested in. Um, treatment guideline recommendations for low back pain without objective findings. I'm sure you're all familiar with these. I think the most important thing is assuring the patient that low back pain is normal and has an excellent prognosis and is not debilitating long-term. But if you take somebody off work and you suggest to them that their work is very physically demanding and they might not be able to go back, then all of a sudden the story starts to look different. And certainly in people who have fear or avoidance behavior, they need additional reassurance. Um, and the goal really is to see if you can mitigate the chances that the person will end up with a chronic pain syndrome. But as you'll see, there are other things that become important in terms of developing chronic pain. And functional improvement really is the most important measure, but that means return to work, certainly, in the workers' compensation plan. 
this case, this gentleman was referred to physical therapy, which at the end of the story, you'll see is endless. Um, he was given NSAIDs. He was given narcotic, not clear what for, except that he had pain complaints. Um, he was placed on light work, but there was no light work, so it wasn't working. Um, and I'm sure he wasn't happy with his, his employer because he'd been there for quite some time. His pain remained unchanged initially, but then as you go through the notes, and I actually saw him for an independent medical exam now three years later, his pain has gotten worse. And they're really based on all the things that we've seen initially. There is not a physiologic or an anatomical explanation for why his pain would be worse. But he's referred to a surgeon because he's failed conservative care. So what does failure mean in the context of conservative care? Um, I think it doesn't matter anymore if you talk to the treating physician or the surgeon. Um, it's equated with failing non-operative treatment, sometimes injections, but mostly mostly non-operative treatment, physical therapy. Um, it is interpreted often by patients. Um, so if they feel as if they failed conservative care, somehow the way that it gets presented to the patient is that surgery is a better option. Um, because you have failed conservative care, that is, you haven't gotten better, it's more likely to be a solution, it's very concrete, and so patients can kind of hang on to that because it appears to be a solution and everybody would like their condition to be fixed. But the other part of that is that it suggests that there aren't any treatment options, and more importantly, it suggests that there is something anatomical that can be but again, when we made this diagnosis, we weren't able to identify any objective findings. Um, I would say that currently, failure of conservative care, everybody has to go for some conservative care, some physical therapy. Um, often nobody takes the time to read the physical therapy notes and find out what else is going on with the individuals. And then they fail conservative care and surgery is picked as the, or surgery is the next step. So in terms of treatment, that really addresses the biomedical model, which is where most patients are, right? They go to the doctor, they think they have an identifiable problem that you will fix. And, and that their pain and whatever limitations they're experiencing are related to that particular problem. Their depression or any other psychological issues, issues that they have at home, they will relate to the fact that they've had this injury and they're not functioning the way they used to function. On the other hand, there is really good literature that's looked at if, if there are 10 people with nonspecific low back pain, they will all describe it differently. And why would the symptoms be different in 10 different people if the pathology is the same? So again, it becomes clear that there is no anatomical injury that we can identify and therefore not want to fix. Um, and that there really isn't a linear relationship between pain, disability, and pain. So although psychosocial factors are often seen as reactions to pain, and as I said, you know, people will say, well, we'll do your operation and your um, pain will get better, or your pain will get better and your depression will go away. It turns out that there is strong evidence that psychological and personality factors are as important or more important than the pathological process in the experience of pain. And pain, you know, the International Association for the Study of Pain describes pain as an emotion. So if you put it in that context, obviously you have to think about the biopsychosocial issues. And pre-morbid psychological, psychological dysfunction, whether the individual recognizes that they have issues or not, whether they've been treated for depression in the past um, or not, is a risk factor for the future development of chronic pain. And I will tell you that in situations in which you end up doing independent medical exams and other evaluations, you have the advantage of getting the person's medical records for years and years. And there is always this little kernel that is, you know, either they were treated for depression, they have a history of alcoholism, which is what turns out to be the case with the gentleman in this case. Um, there's a history of drug abuse, there's a history of adverse childhood events. Some of those things, or any one or many of those things, will be present. And those obviously are all pre morbid. 
So biopsychosocial factors appear to be the most important factor in terms of what the individual's prognosis is and whether or not they will recover. So risk factors for poor outcomes of, or failure of conservative care, depression, obviously, and depression, as you know, is rampant. Um, not everybody identifies having had depression or having had any episodes of depression, but it is known to predict poor outcomes in the workers' compensation setting. If you're fortunate enough to have MMPI, um, have an MMPI, hypochondriasis, hysteria, and depression, somatization are all factors that predict poor outcomes. And surprise, they're often associated with anxiety, alcohol and drug use disorders, and childhood adverse events. So those are all risk factors for poor outcomes. Also, the stress of having a pre-existing mental health problem, if it's been identified, may also present barriers to recovery, which is much nicer way than, or much nicer way of saying failure of conservative care. Um, <laughs> having debilitating back pain, you can imagine, and you see patients all the time, so they're frightened by what's happened. They feel extremely limited. They don't know what to do with their limitations. They don't know how it's going to affect their earning capacity. They identify with their job. So if they don't have a job to go back to, um, or they don't have work to go to on a daily basis, they can't quite figure out where they fit in the world. And this is really generic um, and ubiquitous. This is from level one accreditation resources for Colorado workers. And I just finished doing this, and I'm clicking through the slides on the, this was a cervical spine presentation, and I think everybody has heard a patient say these things. So it's interesting to me that that's what they came up with, but I'm sure the story looks familiar to everyone here. Um, risk factors for chronic pain, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, smoking, um, because that's really a substance abuse, use of narcotics, history of abuse, poor general health. Turns out obesity is another risk factor for chronic pain. They all look the same as the risk factors for failing conservative care. So why would these patients be good surgical? We already know that in workers' compensation, the surgical outcomes are not as good as they are in non-workers' compensation patients. Um, so, and that's the baseline. So then you take somebody who has other issues that are barriers to recovery, and then you intervene with surgery for a condition that doesn't even really have an anatomical finding that we can identify or treat. So when they become a surgical candidate, and I use that term loosely, the question would be, is there finally a diagnosis or identification of a pain generator? And usually in these patients who are now chronic pain patients because they've had their symptoms for three months, um, they are chronic pain patients. There's not an injury that can be identified. And if you could identify an injury three months later, would it be attributable to the initial event? And you have to think about a temporal relationship there, which is not present. Are there objective findings? No, by definition, nonspecific low back pain, chronic nonspecific low back pain has no objective findings. Um, and as we said, are they attributable to the event? Earlier, I talked about how you need a diagnosis in order to do a formal causation analysis. So we know that there are indications for surgery and failure Failure of non-operative care is not one of them, at least not in any of the resources that I reviewed. Um, this is from 2012, and I put the slide next to it, the graph next to it. That's an increase in the number of fusions over time, and that's after 2012, when we already knew, or it was already in the literature, that surgical outcomes are not as good in the workers' compensation population compared with non on workers' compensation cohorts, and that surgery is often used to treat these patients in spite of the fact that we know their outcomes will not be as good. So I think the easiest way to think about it from a practical standpoint is does the person have radicular 
symptoms and true radiculopathy, not just numbness and tingling in their entire leg that comes and goes, <laughs> but true radiculopathy or not. And if they have non-radicular low back pain or axial low back pain, and the same can be said for the cervical spine, they are not likely to have a good outcome with a surgical intervention. Not only are they not likely to have a good outcome, they're likely to continue to use opioids. They are likely to continue to seek care. They may stay in physical therapy. They get sent for injections, all those things. But clearly, surgery is not effective, nor will any of those other things be effective because the real issue hasn't been addressed. The increased risk of an unsatisfactory outcome in the workers' compensation um, population. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, mm -hmm. not all the literature looks at workers' compensation population. So when you are reading something about outcomes for whatever the uh, procedure might be or whatever the intervention might be, you want to be aware of whether workers' compensation uh, population was included and separated out or not. And I would say that's one of the issues with the spine literature is that there's not enough on, it, it, that focuses on the workers' compensation population. Um, so, you know, as a provider, there are a couple of things that you can do, and I'm going to give you some tools as we move through this, but I think it's really important to think about non-operative treatment if it doesn't work as an indication to you that there are other things going on. Because really and truly, the natural history of nonspecific low back pain is that it gets better. Yes, it recurs. Recurrence is common, but mostly it gets better. So if you think that there, if you think about it in terms of there not being a surgical solution, because there's no specific identifiable pain generator, um, then you have to start thinking about how you could frame it differently for the individual. And the preference for surgery, because it is sort of a concrete intervention, I think, you know, somebody's doing something for me. Um, partly driven by the patient, I think, who asks for something to be done and you've exhausted the things that you think should probably work, um, and also driven by providers. And I think, you know, as soon as you say to a patient, there's nothing else I can do for you, I have nothing left in my toolbox, I'm going to send you to the surgeon. Um, as a, one of my mentors used to say, you know, if you go to a barber, he's going to give you a haircut. <laughs> and if you go to a surgeon, they're going to look for a reason to do surgery. Um, so the biopsychosocial perspective is, you know, what we use now, and what really I think is uh, very important to think about in terms of how you interact with patients. Um, pain is an experience. It's an emotion. It's obviously distressing. And you have to think about it, if pain persists beyond the normal healing time for tissues, you know, sprain, strain, non-specific low back, acute non-specific low back pain, if pain persists beyond three months, then you really need to think about what the other drivers are. And it turns out that these have been labeled contextual factors. Um, so in addition to the person's history, which is important, because you wanna know where they came from, and what their stressors are. You also want to think about how you present um, alternatives to them or present their situation to them. Um, something to be on the lookout for. Um, you know, you see this pain diagram before you walk into the room and you say, well, I don't know that I have anything that will help this person. But if you, and remember that your nonverbal communication is important too, I'll talk about it in a minute, but nonverbal matters too. So if you walk in the room with one of those looks on your face, the patient's going to say, well, this doctor isn't going to believe me anyway. I'm only going to give him half the story. And you're not going to have an opportunity to find out what really is the issue, which yes, there's low back pain, but there are probably other issues that need to be explored. So contextual factors, actually, I didn't find this really interesting. It plays a role in, or contextual factors play a role in placebo and nocebo. And I started looking at the information about placebo and nocebo before I found the contextual factors, but, and, and that's a term in the literature. But what you'll see is, yes, there are placebo and nocebo effects that we'll talk about, but um, you can make a big difference in terms of whether you drive a placebo effect or a nocebo effect. So if the patient thinks that non-operative treatment will be helpful, 
they are more likely to get better with non-operative treatment. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting that you look at the psychosocial context and therapeutic ritual, so how you approach the patient, can influence the patient's brain activity. And you can think about any situation in which you've been anxious and somebody's tried to calm you down. So you know, usually when patients come in to see us, they're anxious to start. So it's important how you interact with them. These are the contextual factors that seem to be the most important. Anxiety, obviously. Expectations, really important. Motivation, that sort of goes back to the biopsychosocial um, issues that the person brings with them. Memory and prior experience, somatic focus, um, and personality traits, right? A very negative, pessimistic person probably isn't going to, is going to have trouble with placebo. Um, Placebo effects for the purposes of our discussion are positive outcomes. Obviously, nocebo effects are negative outcomes, but they occur in a psychosocial context and are dependent on the individual's treatment expectation. <laughs> Actually, the intervention itself doesn't matter as much as the expectations. So the nature of the symptom being, being treated is important but really important are patients' beliefs. And remember I said in the very beginning, and that's from Gene Carragy's work, that people believe that you're in a low-speed collision and you have significant injury to your low back or your neck without any objective findings. So those are beliefs that people carry around with them. Expectations, am I gonna get better? Did the lawyer say I'm not gonna get better? Who's telling me I should return to work or not return to work? Um, conditioning like Pavlov's dogs and individual psychological factors. Excuse me. So a placebo intervention isn't necessary. You don't have to give somebody a pill. You don't have to give them an injection. Um, even with active treatment and your interaction, you can see a placebo effect. The physician-patient relationship turns out to be really important and I'd like to think that's why most of us became physicians. I think it's gotten lost in the translation over the years um, as medicine has changed. But as a physician interacting with the patient, you can elicit a placebo effect or a nocebo effect. So your interaction, excuse me, helps predict what will happen to this individual next. Um, just because it's interesting, I think placebos actually cause endogenous release of opioids and non-opioids, and it depends on which effects you're talking about, um, because the non-opioids are some other, um, some other uh, neurotransmitters. But expectations of benefit work and activate people to think that they're going to get better. And so any treatment, any treatment that you provide, including just talking to a patient, your interaction is modulated by placebo effects. It turns out that things like the office setting, whether the exam or whether the waiting room is calm, whether there are 200 people in the waiting room and screaming children or just a couple of people, all those things play a role. The person at the front desk being attentive, all those things play a role in terms of expectations of what the interaction is going to be. And then, you know, that gets you to the next step. So open label placebo is interesting because the patient knows that he or she is getting a placebo. <laughs> it's been shown to be effective in allergic rhinitis, ulcerative colitis, and low back pain. I'm gonna show you a couple of those studies. So there's no reason to think that it wouldn't be um, useful in other settings, but you need to have open administration. The person needs to know that they are getting a treatment, even if they know it's a placebo, it needs to be presented to them. If you do it um, surreptitiously, like inject medication through an IV and don't give the patient any information about it, it turns out the placebo part of it doesn't, isn't effective or doesn't occur. So this is a study from some time ago, open label placebo treatment in chronic low back pain. So um, placebo pills, treatment as usual, and if you were in the treatment as usual group and you didn't get better in three weeks, then you could switch to the placebo pills group. So the people who had open label placebo had greater pain reductions on all their pain scales, maximum pain, minimum pain, the usual pain. The treatment as usual group 
also had reductions in pain and disability when they got switched to the open label placebo group. <laughs> so pretty interesting. Treatment as usual without the open placebo had an increase in pain. So really, that doesn't make any sense if you think about it from a physiologic standpoint, that that's what happened. Um, and of course, if there's reduction in pain, you can anticipate reduction in disability. Um, this is another one. So that was looking at open label and uh, receptive placebos. And there are, you know, there's some interesting literature about the ethics of doing this, but these are all very carefully monitored studies. So 160 people exposed to increasing heat on their forearm. They were supposed to stop as soon as the temperature got to a point that it was unbearable, and they were given a topical cream to use. So group one was told that um, <clears throat> they were given a pain relief cream with lidocaine, but there was no lidocaine, it was placebo. The second group got cream that was labeled as a placebo, but they got 15 minutes of explanations about placebos. Mm -hmm. And the third group got an open label placebo with no explanation. So who would you think does best, right? If you talk to the patient, even if they know it's a placebo, they still get better. If you don't explain to them placebo effect and they don't understand what's going on, then they have more intense and more, more intense pain. And the key thing here is expectation of analgesia, right? Mm -hmm. So the people who got the topical lidocaine, what they thought was topical lidocaine, expected to get relief of their symptoms and did. So, and the people who were talked to for 15 minutes also expected to get better but the last group who didn't have any significant interaction didn't notice any improvement. Um, and then this study looked at um, inflammatory bowel syndrome. There was a waiting list group, a group that got placebo acupuncture, and a group that um, had placebo acupuncture, but also interaction with a practitioner. And I think you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that if you have a relationship with your patient, you know, by the time you get to spending time with the patient, um, the augmented practitioner relationship gives the patient a sense of, um, a sense of whatever the treatment is will work and the courage to think positively. And so as you add each of these components, it turns out that the patient practitioner relationship is the most important part of the puzzle. So you are the most important part of the puzzle. Nocebo effects are the result of negative expectations. Um, a nocebo administration gets negative results, but also important, negative expectations create anxiety. And we already know that anxiety is a predictor of a poor outcome. <clears throat> the other part of that is that anxiety is um, very often associated with depression. So if these things are negative, you know, your chances are 50 50. I cannot tell you how many people I have seen who come in and say, the surgeon told me my chances are 50 50. Well, that takes the surgeon off the hook because if they don't get better, it could be expected. And if they do get better, it could be expected and they were lucky. So, um, you know, this is not a good setup and it happens often, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, it turns out that your view of a treatment and whether or not the treatment will work also affects how the patient perceives the treatment. Um, and importantly, when you're talking about side effects, because of all the things that we've talked about, it matters how you frame them. So if you frame them negatively, people will have them. And if they don't know what to expect and they have these side effects, very often they'll discontinue the medication, not understanding that a side effect isn't necessarily an indication that the medication is bad for them. It's just that they don't understand what's happened. So side effects are something that will happen, but if you explain them in the context of everybody will have a side effect, but it doesn't mean that the medication is doing you any harm, um, then you are likely to have better results. Body language matters a lot. Um, so your posture, your tone of voice, your enthusiasm, the people that you see at the end of the day, it's probably much harder to be nice to those people than it is <laughs> on the beginning of the day. We've all been there. Um, but I think if you can remember this, um, I think you'll find it helpful. 
Um, and even the meaning of pain, understanding pain, um, can be changed from negative to positive by verbal suggestion. So again, if the, the example that I have here, so there was a group that um, was given a, they used a tourniquet and one group was informed that this was, you know, and this would be an adverse experience. Um, the second group was told that the ischemia would be beneficial to the muscles. And because they thought it would be beneficial, they tolerated it for longer. So the patient thinks about really different things than we think about, particularly they bring their expectations, their history, et cetera. And we're talking now about people who are, or the people that are at risk for having poor outcomes. So you need to be even more aware of those people and sensitive to what their background, what their history is. Um, so for those people, when you're talking about complications after surgery, you need to be realistic about the complications. It's reasonable to tell somebody that they will have pain after surgery. Probably not a good idea to say 50-50 chance that you'll feel better and 50-50 chance you won't. Um, confirmation bias. So if you have a friend who got better with the surgery then and you go to the same surgeon or somebody that surgeon knows, you're likely to have a better result than if you know somebody who's had a bad outcome, probably be more hesitant about pursuing whatever the intervention is if you know people who have had a bad outcome. Um, and then catastrophizing turns out to play a role in a lot of um, outcome studies now. Uh, there's a guy named Michael Sullivan who's in Canada. And if you're interested in it, um, catastrophizing, he has a website and he can, it has all his literature. Um, but it turns out that if you are a catastrophizer, I'm sure this is a surprise, your outcomes are not as good. <laughs> Think back to the patient, the initial case, the guy was brought to the ER as a trauma and treated as a trauma, which sort of sets up, and he is a catastrophizer, I'll tell you that, I haven't seen him. So that set things up really not for a good outcome to begin with. Um, so this gentleman now is three years after the event. He's in litigation. It's actually both a personal injury case and a workers' compensation case. When he described his low back pain, he described it as a pilot light. So it's always there. It's always on. He has some degree of pain, but his pain can range from three out of 10 to going to the ER. And this is a guy who has a little bit of medical background. So he has obviously certain expectations about what the interaction will be when he goes to the ER. And I'm going to guess that he gets some positive um, feedback when he shows up in the ER. He also is still on narcotics. Uh, at this point in time, his pain is 90% in his back and 10% in the left lower extremity. And it's not ridiculous, it stops at the knee. He doesn't have any numbness or tingling in a ridiculous distribution. He doesn't have any weakness. Mm -hmm. um, as you would expect, his range of motion of the lumbar spine, excuse the typographical error, um, his he has limited range of motion, but he does have pain with axial loading. So when I did axial loading, first he had neck pain, and then I pushed a little harder, and he had low back pain. Um, and trunk rotation also caused pain. He's still attending physical therapy three years after the incident, because as I said, in Wyoming, you can go to physical therapy forever. Mm -hmm. um, he's not returned to work. And so when I asked him what his plans were, I mean, this is a young guy. He has three kids. His wife does work. Um, he spends his days taking care, taking care of his kids, but his kids are in school. So you can imagine what his days are like. Um, he thought about being a PA and then decided that physically that was too demanding. Um, and so he wasn't sure that he would be able to do that. Then he looked at... Um, organizational psychology, interestingly enough, but also wasn't sure that he would be able to get through school because it involves sitting for extended periods of time at the computer and sitting made his back pain worse. So when I asked him what his understanding of his condition was or what he anticipated, this is what he told me, and these are quotes. Um, there will come a time where the pain will be bad enough and the symptoms will be worse enough that I won't have a choice and I'll have to go to surgery. 
Okay, that doesn't sound like a surgical intervention or a surgical indication to me. And then the surgeon told me if I have one operation, I will need successive surgeries for the rest of my life because we now have adjacent segment degeneration or adjacent segment disease. Um, if it's symptomatic, you call it disease. And that's like the next hot thing for spine surgeons. So you do a two level fusion and somebody who has degenerative disc disease, they will get adjacent segment changes that have nothing to do with their fusion probably. Um, although the jury is still out and you can find literature on both sides, but that doesn't stop the surgeons from doing an operation at one level and the next level and then the next level. And more importantly, the patient anticipates having multiple procedures. And nowhere in this has anybody said, and after your surgery, I expect that you'll go back to work. I expect that you'll be off your narcotic medications. I expect that you'll be able to go hunting and fishing, which are his hobbies. I expect that you'll be able to participate in the mine activities again. That is not anywhere in the medical records, and this guy has no sense that that is in his future. So the likelihood that he will improve, even when there's no identifiable pathology, obviously is not good. So I think, you know, the most important thing, and I guess I'm going to finish up a little bit early because I'm off um, <laughs> is to emphasize to patients, I don't really like this term self-efficacy because I think it's hard to, I mean, if you use the word efficacy, it's not in everybody's vocabulary, but you know, the idea that you can self-soothe or feel better, that you can mitigate your symptoms with things like a hot pack or a cold pack, um, more activity instead of less activity. I, I feel like we don't spend enough time with patients suggesting that those are all things that will work and I may only be speaking for myself, but um, spending enough time with patients, letting them know that those are things that work and, and that there's a natural time course, low back pain in most people, just like idiopathic neck pain, it's better. Um, and really taking care not to transmit negative expectations to patients. Um, I think we forget how vulnerable they are sometimes. And um, you know, if you've been a patient, you know what that feels like, but you know how to navigate the system. Um, and if you think about it, and somebody who has no clue how to navigate the system, and as a lawyer nagging them on one side and saying, you know, don't go out and do this because they'll get you on film and that'll ruin your workers' compensation case, and three small kids at home and a wife who's worried about income and they're worried about their house, those are a lot of things to be worried about for somebody who's not sure what their future holds. So remember that your presence in the therapeutic relationship is more important than really anything else that happens. Um, it matters more than the drug we prescribe. It matters more than the procedures that get performed. And so I hope that will you know, get you motivated to spend a little bit more time figuring out the biopsychosocial part of things because it's so essential to understanding patients. Thank you. We've got quite a few questions and some online. When do you start doing um, the anxiety screening tool or a GAD-9? When do you start to suspect? Um, I actually do them on an initial visit. Mm -hmm. I will have somebody fill out. Um, the, we use a, um, AMA guides to the evaluation of, of um, permanent impairment in Arizona. So I have them fill out the pain disability questionnaire. Mm -hmm. I have them fill out I actually use the catastrophizing pain scale because mm -hmm. I think it gives you a lot of information mm -hmm. um, and any one of those tools that you like, but one that you can interpret readily so that you know what you're dealing with when you start to interact with the patient. So are you also screening for alcohol and drug use? Um, I would say yes, because if somebody has got depression, certainly you're gonna have to think about those things. They are very difficult questions to ask, I know that. But I will tell you, in practice, it gets easier to ask those questions. Um, the nicest way, um, alcohol, I've heard um, the issue of alcohol use disorder come up is, have you ever had a DUI? So, I mean, that's sort of a gentle way to approach it. Um, you know, do you have any history of drug abuse? People say no. But then as you get into their history, you find out that there are other issues. Um, sexual or emotional abuse is a really tough one. Mm -hmm. I actually asked the question on my intake form. 
And if somebody says, yes, I pursue it just a little bit and I preface it with, I know this is a sensitive issue and I don't mean to bring up anything bad, but it's important in terms of understanding who you are and what kind of treatment is appropriate. Um, I think, you know, we're all so socially aware um, that we hesitate to ask those questions, but remember you're driving that really, in terms of the advantage, in terms of giving the individual an advantage or not. And so the more you know about that person, the better you can be at directing care and setting expectations. So I think they're important questions to ask. I know they're hard to ask, but they're important. And I will usually be, I would say, you know, I mean, in a clinic, you're probably 10 minutes into the discussion and maybe even doing the exam while you're asking these questions, because that's a nice distraction. Um, but I think it's, you know, not your, obviously not your first question. Um, Bridget, uh, there's some folks here who are not uh, MDs. Okay. Can you address the topic? Um, can you give some examples, though, of where you think spine surgery is uh, indicated? Oh, sure. So, I mean, the best results are in patients who have radicular pain. So, meaning pain that we know we can identify is from a nerve root. So, it has the pattern that you would expect. You can identify what nerve root it is. I mean, numbness in the leg doesn't tell you what nerve root is affected. So, you can identify what the nerve root is and their MRI. Or what other whatever other study, but preferably an MRI corroborates that finding. So if somebody has a herniated disc on the right side and they have left leg pain, that doesn't fit. If they have a herniated disc at a high level and I see pain in the front of the thigh, but or I would expect pain in the front of the thigh or groin pain, but they're complaining of butt pain and calf pain and foot pain, that's a mismatch. So those people, when there's a matchup between symptoms and findings on MRI, um, are a surgical indication. Spinal stenosis is a weird one. So you know, as you get degenerative changes and the spinal canal narrows, those people feel better when they're sitting and worse when they're walking. And when you're interviewing them and examining them, they're not gonna have any neurologic findings. So you really need a good history, but those are people those are actually my favorite cases because everybody's really happy after you operate on them and they get better. Their tolerance for walking increases. Um, if it's somebody who plays golf and they could do nine holes before and now they can only do three and they need to get in the cart, that's consistent with spinal stenosis. So you would look for historical things like that. Then, of course, fractures, um, instability which you can see on x-rays and you get flexion extension x-rays so you can actually see the vertebrae move. Usually those people will have some neurologic findings mm -hmm. also. Um, so those are all good surgical indications. Those are the indications that are in the treatment guidelines. Um, but as I said, if you can't identify a pathological entity that you're going to treat with surgery, then, you know, you don't take out a gallbladder if the person isn't symptomatic. Mm -hmm. um, if they have diffuse, it's not really different than diffuse, and the patient population is the same. Diffuse abdominal pain, headaches. <laughs> we, we don't see people getting craniotomies all the time for headaches, and headaches are not really that different from nonspecific low back pain in terms of the patient presentation. I've got a question from someone online. Uh, the question is, do you do a trial of, of an SSRI or other mental health medication as part of conservative treatment, even if they don't flag for it on the questionnaire? Um, it's a good question, and I would not be the one to do it. Um, but you guys, well, I shouldn't say that. I, as an orthopedic surgeon, wouldn't do it, but certainly as occupational medicine physicians, if you're comfortable doing it, the is great. So um, there's a lot of literature that suggests that there's just a placebo effect. You have to wait long enough for the SSRI to take effect. I think that, and Kurt, maybe you know something different, but I think the literature is sort of equivocal about yeah. whether that's a way to go. So one other thing to remember is the SSRI antidepressants do not have a, a pain modulating effect. It's got to be the tricyclics, the SNRI antidepressants. And so that's not that well known. But if you're, you're going to just random shotgun it for, for just depression, that's a different story. But it seems like you should probably choose the SNRI so you get both effects, but don't expect a huge effect. And SSRI isn't really <clears throat> very good from mild to moderate depression or anxiety. It's actually the severe that shows the most benefit. Okay, and I would say, you know, 
Ellaville amitriptyline has been around for a thousand years. Um, the icky side effect is that you don't feel so great when you wake up and people sometimes feel hungover. Um, but at a very low dose, it is sometimes helpful in people with chronic pain. Other um, questions? Yeah. So uh, the term conservative care, the term non-operative care, it sounds like uh, you're not too um, much in favor of either of those uh, well, broad brushes. Can you talk a little bit about uh, terms you, you prefer? Sure, I think appropriate care, right? Because conservative care, meaning non-operative care, is the treatment that's appropriate for non-specific low back. It's not a surgical diagnosis. So if you say conservative care, the patient's sense is you're holding something back, you're being conservative as opposed to aggressive. So then they want to know what the more aggressive treatments are, because of course those are more likely to work. Um, and I think non-operative care sort of slams non-operative. And that's really, that is appropriate care, whether it's you know physical therapy or cheerleading or both. <clears throat> that's really the appropriate care for non-specific low back pain, non-specific neck pain. Um, so I think appropriate care or evidence-based care is probably a better term. How about you? I would defer to you on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I personally I have avoided the conservative. I've actually, in our guidelines at one point in time, some people wrote in conservative and uh, we got comments to not use that term. Right. I, I think the that surgical is. house. So. so what's the term non-surgical? Is that? Because I run into the patient seat. Well, I need surgery. You're not fixing it. So, right. What's what's a better term? Well, I think appropriate care. Appropriate care. Yeah. Right. I mean, because then you're telling the patient you're doing what is appropriate, what is indicated, based on you know your experience and treatment guidelines and all that information. You're doing what's appropriate. They may not like it, and that's you know, and that's always an issue. But I think you know the idea that surgery is the fix it when you can't identify a pain generator. It's a hard concept to explain to somebody because remember they come with preconceived notions. Patients come with these preconceived notions that surgery will take care of them. But if you start to talk to them, I mean, you know, maybe it's reasonable to talk to them about the outcomes and say, you know, for what you have, surgery doesn't have a good outcome. Question. Um, I've heard this, it's a little controversial, but I would love your perspective. Do you think annular tears is a pain generator? Do I know? <laughs> um, I don't think there's any good literature that shows that they are. Okay. They are a normal wear and tear phenomenon. Yeah. Um, there's a really good article um, by David Farden. It's the guy's name. And the article is called Nomenclature 2.0. And it talks about the nomenclature that's used in spine. And it's applicable to cervical spine. But it talks mostly about lumbar spine. Mm -hmm. Um, and they talk about annular tears actually being annular fissures. So the proper term is annular fissure, because if I say annular tear, you think, oh my God, it happened acutely and it's bad. Mm -hmm. If I say annular fissure, you say, oh, well, you know, that's just one of those age-related things. So, but I don't, I don't believe that it's a pain generator, because I don't think you can distinguish it from any of the other degenerative changes that are going on at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One question about your data, you had your graph that showed the cases of fusion have gone up. Was that all cases, both neurosurgeon and orthopedic? Yes. And is there possibly any difference between the fields? I don't think there is now. I think people consider themselves spine surgeons. and They don't mm -hmm. distinguish between the two. I, the other thing, though, that I think is interesting is now that there's minimally invasive surgery, you know, that's a very sexy term because it sounds like it's not going to hurt anybody because it's minimally invasive. <laughs> it is the same procedure. Mm -hmm. The indications for minimally invasive procedures are the same as the indications for open procedures. It is just a technical term. And a minimally invasive fusion is no is not likely to have a better outcome than, in fact, there, I think I just read a study where it said minimally invasive fusions and open fusions have the same outcome. Um, patient selection is really the issue. You had childhood adverse events on a couple of slides. I think you might have answered that later of what those are. And I just so, want to make sure we're all on the same page. 
Sure. So um, certainly abuse is one of those things, but multiple moves during the course of childhood. So you never really had a friend base or you never really felt secure in a, in a location. Um, this, uh, divorce counts as one um, parent who's an alcoholic, you know, or alcohol abuse, drug abuse in the home. So all the things that you can think of that would be unpleasant child really do contribute and there is literature that shows that the more of those factors there are and very often they coexist um the more vulnerable obviously the person is and the more likely they are to be a chronic pain patient um, oh please um you you pull on the um, concept of litigation as being a negative factor as well and you may be particularly well suited to responding to that type of question how, how do we do you have any recommendations for approaches for trying to reduce that impact on recovery? Um, I think it's important to know what the lawyer has told the individual. Remember, and this sounds so cynical, but it's true. The lawyer is not in it to get the patient better. The lawyer's <laughs> in it for the lawyer. And I mean, in the state of Arizona, lawyers who do workers' compensation get um, I don't remember what the percentage is. It's probably some agreed upon percentage of whatever the patient uh, gets paid, right? So they get a percentage. And in Arizona, you're covered for your life. It's not, it doesn't stop at 65. So lifetime. So it's a lifetime benefit for the lawyer too. And I think there's really no incentive for the lawyer to really want the individual to get better. So, but the only way you can really address that is to know what the individual has been told, what the patient has been told by their lawyer. Um, and sometimes they'll be forthcoming and sometimes not. Um, and sometimes they don't understand. Um, but usually they'll tell you if they're doing it. They sort of come in with an attitude that makes you, you know, you already know that there's something going on with those patients. Um, and I don't know that there's a good way around it because they're competing interests, really. And, and that's part of why it doesn't, you know, it's part of why people don't get better if they have a lawyer telling them your case isn't worth as much. And when you look in the personal injury cases, when you look at those, uh, very often they're done on a lien, which means that by the time the lawyer and the physicians get paid, the patient really isn't seeing very much. Um, so people have family, friends, and also patients that they're providers who push and push and push uh, for the surgical evaluation. Any thoughts on how you'd advise folks to handle that? I think, you know, if you put it in the context that those people don't have a medical background, um, so they're pushing for emotional reasons, they want to see the person get better, um, they're, you know, there's something about the, something about the relationship that works for the interaction that works for the, the person who's pushing for surgery, um, but I think the easiest way to address it, which I have tried to do more recently, um, is to ask about that and say, you know, who's saying to you that surgery is indicated? Did the surgeon tell you that surgery is indicated? No, my aunt said she knew somebody who had surgery for their low back and they got better. But that person might not have had the same indications. And I think it's important to explain to the patient, again, that there are indications for surgery, and there are conditions that we know won't improve with surgery. So um, I try to be very straightforward about that, kind of like there are indications for taking penicillin, you know, or some find some metaphor that works. Um, but I think it's important that they understand that they don't have all the information about the person who had the procedure, um, that somebody knew somebody who knew somebody, um, or that the, it, you know, that their family or whatever, in, in the legal cases, unfortunately, it increases the value of the case when you're speaking. So that's a, another issue. Any last questions? Archie, thank you so much. Thank you.